This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. And welcome to Us Versus Them, Patients and Caregivers Confront Healthcare. I'm Marianne Sterling. Thank you for joining us. This inaugural episode is going to tackle a very important topic, gender bias in healthcare. So buckle in. I'm joined by two experts who are going to educate us on this subject. Julie Stam, who has been living with multiple sclerosis for 16 years, and journalist and author Maya Dusenberry, who literally wrote the book on this. It's called Doing Harm, the truth about how bad medicine and lazy science leave, leave women disabled, misdiagnosed, and sick. Welcome to you both. Julie, I'm going to start with you and ask that you share a brief synopsis of your healthcare journey for our listeners and share a few examples of the gender bias that you have experienced. Well, thank you for having me, Marianne. I love talking to both of you, and I'm excited to be here today. It took me a very long time to get diagnosed. From 2001 to 2007, I was dismissed by countless doctors, whether they said it was that time of the month or it was because of change in diet. It was never really looked into. I just kept going to doctors and I kept hearing excuses as to why I would be having these symptoms. It took such a long time that I ended up going to a geriatric doctor at the very last you know, hope for finding what was going to be happening. And he was the one that ordered an MRI, which was my smoking gun. I think now times are a lot different. People are getting diagnosed quicker and more effectively. But I still find that there are issues within the healthcare community, especially around gender. And I think the most important thing is becoming your own advocate and realizing that you can choose different physicians that, and that they work for you. Yeah. And Maya, is this a typical experience for women who have MS and other autoimmune disorders? Yeah, absolutely. My own interest in this topic actually began because I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder, rheumatoid arthritis, several years ago. And, you know, before that, I had been a very healthy 20-something, so I really hadn't interacted with the medical system all that much. And so it was really the first time that I sort of gave any thought at all to whether the medical system was well equipped to care for me if I were actually sick. And my own diagnostic journey was a lot more straightforward than Julie's. You know, I was diagnosed within six months. And I think in part that was because I had a pretty abrupt and kind of textbook onset of the illness. But after I was diagnosed, I became really interested in learning about autoimmune diseases generally, wondering why it was that these conditions that impact so many people, you know, are estimated to affect 50 million people in the U.S. and do disproportionately impact women. So 75% of those patients are women. There isn't a lot of public awareness, and there also isn't a lot of awareness in the medical system. And so, so many patients do have experiences like Julie's where they're misdiagnosed for months, if not years, often have to go to multiple doctors before they're properly diagnosed. And during that time, often feel like their symptoms are not taken seriously or sort of dismissed as, you know, stress or anxiety or depression. And so that was really the impetus for writing writing this book is kind of trying to figure out why it is, what the history and systemic issues in the medical system are that explain why so many women have experiences like that. Julie, I want to dig a little bit more into your personal experience here now that we've heard a little bit of perspective from Maya. How have these experiences impacted your health journey? I mean, dismissal by doctors 
uh, certainly has an, an impact on you it, psychologically and how you approach and physically, <laughs> you know, and physically, I was down to 97 pounds when I finally got diagnosed because every time I would go to the doctor, I would hear you're okay. This is, you know, you need to go to a psychiatrist, which I did do. And luckily he said, you know, this is not something that's in your head. You're dealing with not you're not depressed but it's a response to something that's un, you know, unwell within your body but i was n really sick i mean you could visibly see it because i just couldn't figure out why all these things were happening and to go from a, like like maya i was perfectly healthy in my 20s and then to go from oh wow i i have bladder and bowel issues now and then oh wow i can't walk in the heels that i walk to the office and i can't get home from here now i mean these it just deteriorating and deteriorating and then going to hear like this is not something that we can try to treatment for is not only disheartening it's discouraged like you're hopeless so when i was diagnosed with ms i like celebrated and that's the weirdest thing thing to say but i was so happy to have an answer because right then i knew i can fight and if you don't know then you're literally just fighting an imaginary battle but once I knew, I was like, I'm equipped to find the best treatment, find the best medical care, and find my, my team. And that team can evolve, and it has. But what you need in the beginning of diagnosis to what you need in later stages is very different. But it is very important to find people that are going to care for you and listen to you. Because, you know, they always say they only listen to your first three questions. That shouldn't be acceptable. We, if you have 50 questions... Get a doctor that's going to listen to your 50 questions. It, it's not acceptable to be like, you have to fit a history, you know, even now as reestablishing care in a new state, you have to fit a history of 16 years into your first, you know, three questions with this physician. Unacceptable. I'm on a mission to not allow that be the case anymore. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we've talked about sort of in, in your journey, there were specific points of failure in your interactions with the health care system that likely changed the course of your health. Something that, you know, an avoidable action and inaction, some bad advice or wrong path that led to a setback. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, you know, I'm still saddened by it because if I got the treatment that I have now when I was first diagnosed, I know that I would be in better shape. That's not in my mind. That is based on the evidence that if you get on the right treatment, it can slow the disease down. Unfortunately, I wasn't treated properly with the right medication, so I was progressing. So I have that progression is not reversible for me. So I lost all of that because I didn't get the right treatment. Because, you know, they didn't want to fight with the insurance for me. They didn't, you know, you just have to go with this drug because it's the easiest and most accessible. I wasn't brought into clinical trials. I mean, I'm much more of an advocate now, but it's taken a long time. So and MS is different than it used to be. You know, now there's dozens of treatment options. Back then there were only three, you know, and then when the fourth came along, they were hesitant to give it to young people. But I know once I got on my right treatment path, I was in good shape and I, I hope to be stable. But I do know that I wrote my first physician, the general practitioner that I went to after the fact, and I was like, hey, just want to let you know I was diagnosed with MS, just so if you have any other patients that come in that have similar symptoms, like numbness, weakness, just general, like, Charlie, I always complain, like, I have a Charlie horse feeling because I had cramping and spasms. If you hear this, you know, maybe send him for an MRI. Just didn't, wasn't trying to be insulting, couldn't have said it more politely. I ended it with, like, I appreciate your care. And he wrote back with his lawyer's information. And that, to me, is unacceptable. Like, I, you should learn from, it wasn't a mistake. He missed it. I mean, that I guess technically is a mistake, but he, he missed something. And the only way to learn is from learning from that. His response is a representation of how he was a, as a physician. What do you dread most about your next interaction with the healthcare system? Because you certainly must have some reservations at this point after what you've been through thus far. I am so fortunate that I have amazing care in New York, and I go to Dr. Sadiq. He is by far the best I've ever been to. But I live in Colorado, and he's in New York, so I tried to establish care here. And it's very hard to find a physician that's willing to collaborate on care. And I think if they genuinely care about you, they're willing to collaborate. It's not an offense to them. It's not to bruise their ego. It is to give you the best care based on what you choose to, uh, to see as your best care. Unfortunately, the neurologist that I went to here does not agree to 
collaborate, so I have to reestablish care again. And it's not like New York where there's neurologists on every street corner, so I'm going to the same MS center, and I hope not to run into him. <laughs> but it's it, that dread that, you know, and not only that, like pi- applying for patient assistance. You know, Rituxan wasn't covered for MS for a long time. So I applied for patient assistance, and they have a wonderful program at Genentech, but physicians don't tell you about that. So you have to find out about that. And then if you've changed physicians, you have to reapply for all of that. So these are things that just weigh on you as a patient. It's not as easy as just having a doctor that cares about your well-being. It's just, it, I wish it were that easy. I was very fortunate to have the experience of living in the UK when I was first diagnosed. So I understand universal health care, and I appreciated that. I never got a bill for any of it. Like, I never had to worry about the cost of catheters. I never had to worry about the cost of steroid infusions. It was all taken care of because I was the patient, I was sick, and they cared about getting me better. That's certainly a, 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 a in some ways, a, a glowing endorsement of universal health care in some ways. And, and, and as you're pointing out, uh, the exorbitant cost of care and all things related to health care here in the States, including what we call DME or durable medical equipment that most people who have a chronic condition will need at some point. It, it, what did you, do you trust the healthcare system? I, I have to ask that question. I don't think trust is the word that I would use for it. I think it's necessary because I need someone to write the prescription. I think it should be easier. I think that Every doctor I go to, I pose the same question. Is this the treatment you would give your wife or your daughter? Because then they're forced to see me as a person and not just typing away at their after-clinic notes while they're with me. But it's really hard. It's, I, I wouldn't say that anything... You know, I really appreciate my neurologist in New York because he even said, he's like, the medical industry has not been kind to you. And I have records of it. I have every... And I, that was the first time a physician acknowledged that. And I appreciate that because I have records. I mean, back then we printed everything out. So I have binders of my medical history. And, you know, in some of the notes, she's dressed appropriately. What does that have to do with what I'm coming here for? Like, just going back to the notes and, like, I I cry when I read them because I feel like I wish I could go back and change who that girl was because I was just young and, like, desperate for answers and willing to try anything they gave me you know if they said swallow an avocado pit I would have done it like I didn't care I just needed to get better and you know I still feel and I feel I'm a patient advocate because I don't want other people to feel the way I did but unfortunately I think it is still as Maya had mentioned it's still a big reality for a large portion of people it really is and you know I I listened to the uh the quote that you mentioned from one of your providers in in his notes. And and I wanted to share with you all today and with our listeners a quote from a friend of mine who is battling Parkinson's disease. And she told me this, my movement specialist doctor, a woman, called me an idiot and stupid for thinking supplements could help my Parkinson's. And she went on to say, Not often I get called stupid and an idiot. The doctor then asked if I would like to schedule a follow-on appointment. This is what women are facing every single day. And Maya, I know you and your book, you share a lot of stories from women who, just as you heard me relate this uh, particular unfortunate quote, have experiences like this that are almost unbelievable to to the 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 average citizen yeah absolutely you know i think when i was doing interviews for the book one kind of recurring theme from from women that i spoke to especially i think younger women who sort of had gone into the medical system taking for granted that they you know had a degree of authority in their lives you know were pretty used to being taken seriously in other aspects of their life we're really shocked to come up against that that sexism, that dismissal, to kind of realize that they were being treated as not reliable reporters of what was going on in their bodies and up against this real stereotype that, you know, is really deeply entrenched in medicine, that women are hysterical, that they're prone to psychosomatic symptoms. So in my book, that's one of the, the main themes, you know, I, I talk about the two big problems 
that women are up against in the medical system being the knowledge gap. So we just don't have a lot of knowledge about women's symptoms, um, conditions like autoimmune diseases that disproportionately impact us. We don't, we're still kind of playing catch up and understanding how men's and women's experience of, of the same disease or responses to treatment can sometimes differ. And then this other big second problem is what I call the trust gap. So this tendency to normalize or psychologize women's symptoms. And I think, you know, you you see examples of that in Julie's story, you know, the kind of dismissal of, oh, you know, it's just that time of the month. I think that's a really common way that women's symptoms are often dismissed, you know, especially, you know, anything kind of related to pelvic pain or menstrual pain is, oh, you know, it's just cramps and, you know, it's perfectly normal to be sick. And then that, you know, recurring theme of, of just being told it's it's kind of all in your head. And, you know, usually those particular words aren't directly used, but so many women do get that sort of insinuation. Um, and I think it's really notable that, you know, Julie ended up going to a psychiatrist, you know, as, as people do when, you know, you're desperate for any help. And if you're being told that that might help you, of course, and then having having that actual mental health professional be the one to say, yeah, no, there's something physical going on here. And I think that really just kind of speaks to the fact that that sort of psychosomatic diagnosis is really being used not as like a real diagnosis, but as this sort of way to dismiss patients and to kind of get them out of the office and to make it somebody else's problem. It isn't rooted in in a real understanding of of psychology. It's it's just kind of another way to say, I don't know what's causing your symptoms, and I'm kind of unwilling to kind of acknowledge that and, and figure it out. And Julie, you've obviously become your own advocate, and I, I might add an amazing advocate at that in the multiple sclerosis community. This is not easy for most people, right? Being your own advocate, th- this is not in everybody's wheelhouse, right? And I know you have a wonderful support system around you. So tell us a little bit about that journey as well. And a little bit about your husband and his role. I keep going back to reestablishing care because the physician here I genuinely think is a terrible human being. When I first met him, he took my blood pressure. Well, he didn't. He said, you have high blood pressure. And I was like, yeah, it's, you know, because I just moved here, the elevation and stuff. He's like, no, I think it's white coat syndrome. And I don't have white coat syndrome. I'm 16 years in. So I don't see physicians as anything other than level with me because I know more about the disease than they do because I'm actually living it. So I'm more of an expert on multiple sclerosis. They might know, you know, what the disease looks like on an MRI and progression, but I'm living it. So I know this disease. So I don't have that white coat syndrome thing. I'm not scared of a physician at this point. I don't get worked up. Like they're, I get more worked up around teachers at my son's school than I would ever get around a physician because kindergarten teachers are pretty scary now. <laughs> they're, um, but it was amazing how his demeanor had changed when my husband was in the room as opposed to even the way he sat was different. And to, my, my husband like immediately walked out of there and was just like, we are never going back to him again. There's no way you can ever go back to that position. Like, you can't. Um, and I agree. With, like, I, and I feel bad for anyone that goes to him. I feel bad for anyone that goes to a physician that looks at their computer and types and I'm in a stem cell trial in New York, and I'm very fortunate to be one of the 50 worldwide that got selected to be in this. And I am happy to, and it's not a decision that was easy to make, but it is something that I made because I have a son and I want to do whatever I can. And if I'm provided an opportunity that people would kill for, I'm going to do it. And he was along the lines of the idiot thing. He said, oh, I would have put you in a mental, into, mental, into, mental institution before I let you do that. And I was already two years into the trial. I'm like, how do you say that to a patient that's already been going in this trial? Like, I've had spinal infusions for the last two years. Like, I'm obviously going to complete it. I obviously do it because I believe in it. I've done my research. He didn't know anything about it and already had said that he would put me in a mental institution if I had mentioned it to him. So I think it's really important to find physicians that care and that Unfortunately, sometimes with time, you know, I always tell people, you don't have to go with the oldest one with the most experienced physician because sometimes the newer guys, they have better information, more up-to-date information. 
they have a new set of eyes. So they, I personally don't need to go to the chief of neurology. I would rather go to someone that is within their first few years and is learning and is willing to learn with me because that's, those are the, establishing care with the ones that are black and white, we've done this, this is what's worked, I'm not going to change my treatment regime, isn't what works anymore. So it's up to us, but it is hard, especially when you're first diagnosed, not to go with the one that has the most experience and you think is better based on paper. But I urge people to really, first off, see multiple physicians. I don't think you have to go to one neurologist. I think you should try people out. It's just like, you know, a, a relationship. You have to find the right fit, and you have to, you know, emotionally and just in line with what how you want to tackle the disease because some people want to go a more natural way. Some people want to go, you know, with diet and exercise. Some people want to, I'm a very aggressive treater, so I am all for medication and whatever's going to keep me stable, but you have to find someone that's in line with your values and your mission and not make you feel like an idiot for what your values are. So it's, it's, it's almost like an interview process, isn't it? It is. It's just, it's a hard interview because you're, you're reliving. I think in the beginning it's different, but when you're further in, you relive your entire 16 years every time you reestablish care. And those are traumatic years. And, you know, like if you, you don't want to cry because then it's like, then they think you're being emotional. You don't, want, but you, it's hard to relive trauma of 16 years, especially with, I'm 16 years living it, 21 years having it. So six years of dismissal, that's the part that's hard to relive. That's the part that I am tearful about because that young girl just took it. You know, I had tests and tests and tests and all it would have taken was an MRI, a simple MRI. And I don't know why physicians are so, I do, in some ways I get it, but I think if you're having these issues and you're not diagnosed, don't be cheap with diagnostic testing. There's, it's up to our insurance to pay for it, and it's up to us if we want to put our bodies through it. I understand there's limited access and you have to allocate to the patients that def definitively need it, but if you have a patient that's suffering and is down to 97 pounds, or you know, in any way that is suffering and begging for answers, do the tests, especially numbness, tingling, you know, all the blanket uh, symptoms, you know, the traditional symptoms that me, if I ever talked to someone, they told me all of my initial symptoms, I'd be like, you should probably go to a neurologist and get an MRI. The fact that it took that long for, I mean, I was going to gastros and everything, and it's like, it shouldn't have taken that long, and obviously I'm still bitter, but um, I think that's okay, and I think now is my time to speak up about it because I don't want other people to do it. And I think the overall message here is healthcare providers, listen to your patients. Listen. I will add, though, on a realistic note, the U.S. healthcare system is set up to make it not easy to vote with your feet not easy to change depending on your insurance or lack of insurance, right? It is not easy to just simply change providers, not to mention the fact that there are a lack of uh, certain providers in our country, obviously, particularly in the neurology field. So, you know, th this is a much more complex and nuanced issue trying to find a new doctor, Right. And Maya, I got to ask this. This is embedded in our healthcare culture, th this problem of gender bias. How can we move the needle on this issue? What's it going to take? Is it advocacy? Is it education? What can we do proactively? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, all of the above, really. You know, I think there definitely needs to be more education both, you know, just education to kind of close that knowledge gap that I talked about so that doctors are getting the training they need to, to properly diagnose women and, and to be, I think, and also education to just be aware of these biases. You know, I think we're starting to um, have more of a conversation, you know, in the media and also within the medical system about unconscious bias and and pushing future doctors to kind of think about how you know, there are stereotypes around gender as well as race and, you know, fat phobia, you know, 
a whole range of, of biases that impact care. So I think that is one thing. You know, it's interesting hearing Julie's story of of reaching out to the the doctor that missed her diagnosis and, and giving that feedback because one of the things I always say in answer to this question is that I do think that a really big part of the problem when it comes to those sort of missed or misdiagnoses is this lack of feedback. We don't have, you know, systems in place for doctors to hear that they missed a diagnosis from a woman who, you know, may have gone to four doctors and then finally was diagnosed by a fifth doctor. It's not like those first four doctors get a memo saying, hey, just FYI, (laughs) you might want to know and and learn from the fact that you missed this. And I think that is a really big way that the problem is really kind of self-perpetuating at this point. So that stereotype that women are prone to unexplained psychosomatic symptoms is in part sort of created by the fact that so many women are experiencing these long diagnostic delays and doctors aren't getting that feedback. And so I think it's really unfortunate that <laughs> when Julie did what I think many patients should do, you know, you know, obviously the onus shouldn't be on individual patients to write that sort of message, but the fact that that helpful <laughs> response was met with such defensiveness, such a lack of sort of humility and a recognition that that sort of feedback is exactly what you want to to make the system work better for people is too bad. Um, So yeah, I think one thing is kind of advocacy around that, you know, and and so I I talk about the power of just women telling their stories, I think can do a lot to kind of shift the narrative to to one, to let other women know that, you know, they're not alone, that this is a common problem, that it's not just them, that it's not something about how they're presenting or, you know, just bad individual bad luck, that this is really indicative of these larger systemic problems. Because I think that in itself can sort of empower people to push back and to find the second opinion or the seventh opinion. And also, I think those kind of stories can help show people within the medical system that this is a really big problem, because I think we're still not quite at the point where it's really recognized as such. And I like that point. This is, we haven't emphasized this enough already for our listeners. This is not a problem that one or two women have. This is a systemic problem that millions of women are experiencing, and we're just not talking enough about it. And Julie, I want to give you the last word today because your story is an is amazing story of resilience in a system that, uh, boy, you got to have some resilience if you have a chronic condition and you're dealing with the U.S. healthcare system. Have you seen anything that encourages you, that gives you hope for the future of healthcare? What g- give us a positive here that we can hang on to? I have so many positives actually. Um, so for someone that's been burned. A lot. I have more positives than burns, <laughs> um, to be honest with you. Now I think you know they have PCORI, they have patient. I can't remember what it stands for. Patient outcome research. Patients have a voice, and I think now that we have that, and they're actually listening. You know, these the drug panels they never really took into account. Like, what was important to the patient? Is it most important? You know, the efficacy. Is it the side effects? Is it the administration? of the medication, now they're taking into account what the actual end user needs. And I think that's important because I don't know that the end user was always valued. I think now I at least once a week get to get my opinion asked on what's important, whether it comes to advocacy or whether it comes to what's important to telling our children about dealing with a chronic illness. What's important to me with respect to medication um, that the one there are so many that are becoming available. Like, why is it important to have one that's on the market longer? What what holds you back to go starting a new medication? But I think the patients are getting a voice, and we're all finding our voice. And social media is not the best all the time, but it is also very, very, very useful. You can find your community, and I think when we all get together, we're stronger than any medical industry because we are the patients we are going to fight and i refuse to let anyone like get a second mortgage on their house because they don't know about patient assistance programs i refuse 
doctors don't tell you about that. There's a, you know, that's unethical to me, but they don't. So I'm going to talk up about it, and I think it's very important that people know that these are options for you. It doesn't they're not always means based. So people often think that they can't have patient assistance programs because they make too much money. That's not necessarily always the case. So it's always worth looking into your pharmaceutical. But it's also like there are many medical options out there. So I always say like be a powerhouse. If you have a drug and you want to like I'm on Rituxan. I love it. It's the only drug that works for me. I reached out to Genentech. I am proud to say that I partner with them. You know, I get those out to my bladder. I just had it yesterday. I'm proud to say that I partner with Allergan because I want them to have my feedback and know that they have changed my life. And it's important, and that doesn't have to be those are the drugs that work for me. My sister also has MS, and different drugs work for her. So it's important that you understand that it does vary, but it's up to you to find what works for you. It, I wish a physician could just be like, hey, this is like your magic fix and you're going to be fine. It's not really a reality. It's up to us to make the educated decision and it's our bodies and those side effects that could be minimal for one person could be great for you and vice versa. But now our voices matter and it's time not to be silent and or silenced and speak up for yourself and find your care team. And I say it with a understanding heart because I'm still trying to find mine here in Colorado. So I know what it's like, but I refuse to sit back and like stick with someone that doesn't. If I am up and worried about seeing a physician, there's something wrong with that relationship. So, but my my positive note is that we matter and they're listening to us now. So use your voice. I love it, and and I think the overall message here that we want our listeners to take away is more education is needed. And by the way, no two patients are alike. And Julie spoke eloquently about individualized treatment plans. Uh, one drug does not work the same on 10 people. So we, we really have to get more in the mindset that patients are individuals, women are individuals, and this, this one-size-fits-all mentality is just not going to work moving forward. So I want to wrap up by thanking my guest. If you have not read Maya's book, Doing Harm, please get your copy today. I can tell you that mine is dog-eared and has copious notes in the margins. And Julie, I know that you also have a book. So tell us a little bit about that before we go today. I do. I wrote a children's book and I'm very proud of it. It's called Some Days, A Tale of Love, Ice Cream, and My Mom's Chronic Illness. And it's for children to understand what it's like to live with a chronic illness, with a parent with a chronic illness. And it takes away all the fear and it empowers the child, which is very important. And I'm also, I'm just going to mention it, I'm working with Dr. Jenny Wu on a project. Um, it's a 52 Essential Inclusion deck. And we are very, very excited to highlight hero stories. And we are going to bring awareness to countless different differences. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to change the world and I really think this one's going to leave a footprint. Well, thank you so much for your advocacy and Maya for yours and the incredible work that you did in your book. Finally, I'd like to dedicate this episode to my dear friend Tracy Evans Rowe, who lost her life 2 years ago next month due to gender bias in healthcare. So join us next time on Us for Healthcare. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.